going along with our topic today. And uh, wanted to focus on life change. Life change. We uh, now come to our memory verse, and it's uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. It'll be the one for this week and for next week uh, because of the topic we're discussing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, please read this with me. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. You may be seated. I don't want to offend you, but I have a sister who's gay. You don't know the struggle she's been through from people who are telling her that she's going to go to hell. Or what? Loving someone? And where are these two going to go find the trigger? How come the word homosexuality hasn't been in the Bible until a few decades ago? And if homosexuality is such an abomination, then why is the word abomination used to describe eating shellfish? And if God is love, then why? I just want to tame up you two are kissing in public. You are obviously gay. What do you think of gay marriage? I love gay marriage. I have a lot of gay friends. I love the gay community. You two men? Um, no, we're not married. We're thinking of getting married. Yes. Yeah, I think everybody should be able to love who they want to love, no matter if you love a woman or a man. Who cares? Gay marriage. I think they should be able to do whatever they want. Love is love. Love has no color. I think that everyone should be free to marry who they want. I just know that. I love gay marriage. I love gay people. <laughs> so what does God think of homosexuality? That's a stupid question. I think you should just stay out of it. I have a lot of gay friends that go to church every Sunday. They believe in God and they're gay. Are they going to burn in hell for being gay? Are people born that way? I believe so. I was. You think they're born that way? They're born that way. Sure. No attraction to men? No. And what about you? So ever since the day I was born. <laughs> You've always had gay tendencies? <laughs> always. Change your mind? Yeah, you, you just, yeah, you might move your class. That makes sense? Yes. <laughs> does that make sense? That makes sure. sense, yeah. That does make sense. You're very good at this, honestly. This is actually a very good argument. So I've been um, watching the videos that you showed me okay. all day today. I'm kind of starting to feel a little nervous because it's starting to all make sense. Does that make sense? It does. I have a question for you. Can you tell that I'm a lesbian? Today and next week, we are tackling a very difficult topic, a very appropriate topic for our world today, and not just America, but around the world. And there was just so much information as I started getting these things ready the past few weeks that uh, I realized there's no way to cover it in one lesson. Uh, so I split it up into two lessons. <clears throat> so we'll talk about, of course, life change as we sang today, but also singing about that next week too. But we're looking at responding to the LGBTQ plus arguments. And some of the things that you saw we'll be talking about in this uh, short series. Um, this is a very important, very controversial topic in our world today. A very sensitive topic today too, by the way. And if you're listening or watching later and you have kids nearby, I would encourage you to have them preoccupied because even though I'm not going to get into gross details, some of the things that we will discuss are not appropriate for kids. Uh, what we'll talk about today and next week uh, could also get me thrown in jail in some places. Whether you're real, aware of that or not, that is a reality. Um, <clears throat> but the topic is <clears throat> homosexuality, transgenderism, bisexuality, and, and more. Uh, it's not going to go away. We cannot stick our head in the sand and say, oh, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it. <clears throat> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And I know that, <clears throat> excuse me, I know this has touched some of your lives as well in some way, shape, or form, too. One aspect of this, <clears throat> by the way, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but you need to be aware of, is its connection to pagan spirituality. There is a connection between this issue of homosexuality, androgyny, and 
pagan spirituality and paganism. Um, I'll let you do some studies on that, though. But just to let you know where I'm coming from, when I was in college, <clears throat> I majored in technical theater. I met, worked with, and had friends who were homosexuals. You know, I've had a very unique uh, life when it comes to this that a lot of Christians have not had. I had a teacher who was gay. I knew his partner in college. Uh, working as a makeup artist for about 13 years, you meet some very interesting people in the entertainment field. <clears throat> I met homosexuals, met lesbians, gays, those who support the homosexual lifestyle. <clears throat> so as I talk about these things today and next week, please be aware that I have friends who live in it, and I still know some who struggle with it today, even as Christians. So while we must be bold in the things that we say and uncompromising with Scripture, what I will say is not going to be out of hate in any way, shape, or form. But it is going to be out of love. But we need to be aware of some things. In June 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court, with the praise of politicians and the president, ruled that same-sex marriage become legal across America. That changed this country forever that changed the dynamic of this country, that changed the morality of this country forever. For those who don't know, in the 1970s, homosexuality was viewed as a mental illness. That is until gay lobbyists, Hollywood, and more uh, later got the American Psychological Association, and even today, by the way, the World Health Organization, to say that it is not a mental illness. Even this month of June is called Pride Month. You've probably seen you know, pictures and things like that where you see uh, rainbow flags hanging everywhere, people wearing t-shirts, hats, and things like that. It is also during this month that gay pride is celebrated, which is why it's called that. You see it around, particularly in our area today. Theme parks, shoe companies, clothing companies. You see in some of the commercials. Makeup companies, department stores, even some schools and churches and others and more are celebrating or taking pride in this lifestyle. And these ideas are spreading, again, not just in America, but around the world. And it's becoming more and more important that we as Christians be aware of this. And so much so that I discovered, actually, uh, one article I read on LifeSite News <laughs> talked about the LGBTQ themes in English homeschool curriculum. <coughs> That's happening in our world today. Yet if you say that homosexuality or transgenderism is a sin, then you are vilified, called a homophobe, evil, unloving, and more. I don't know if you heard about the guy that was trying to get a, uh, a parade going, I think it was in Boston recently, um, celebrating his heterosexual lifestyle as a regular heterosexual man. He was murdered on the internet, vilified on social media mocked by people. That's the world we live in. And years ago when this whole thing began, many who were living this way basically said, well, we want to be recognized. We just want to be recognized. We just, you know, just want to be left alone. And well, as time goes on, this is not the case. This is not what is happening. This is not true. There is an agenda you need to be aware of. And while not every homosexual was involved in this, I need to say that up front, there is a, a push for the acceptance of this lifestyle. And most will demand that you celebrate it, promote it, endorse it, legitimize it, and even spread it to others like a religion. If you never thought about it that way, think about that. This is again growing in something that's happening more and more in our world today. This has touched the church too, and we're gonna deal with some of that next week. And uh, even in a presentation online, I heard a <coughs> Christian speaker say, Jesus suffered from gender dysphoria. Why? Because he was God in human flesh. That's blasphemy. And when it comes to approval, we need to recognize too that the related area of homosexual unions, which are called um, unfortunately marriage, which is not marriage, but also revolves around the adoption of children. The push for them to be able to adopt children too. Very big and very important. Now, that's been happening for quite some time, and actually, this is not only devastating to a child, but some of these kids have, quote, come out 
and explain some of the things that they grew up with and some of the perversion that they saw and were a part of or witnessed. And part of this and what we're going to talk a little bit about today is not only the their desire to engage in this lifestyle, but also that they deserve certain rights and positions because of that lifestyle. <clears throat> this is where various arguments come in, used to justify these things. Now, we can't cover all of them, but today, again, Lord willing, next week, by God's grace, I want to equip you all to lovingly, intelligently, <laughs> biblically discuss this topic to those who adhere to these unbiblical ideas. So first we're going to look at the argument, then we'll give some counter-arguments to these things. So first on your outline, civil rights arguments. Civil rights arguments. And this is something, again, going on as I'm speaking. There's these things in America. There's these bills that are trying to be passed in America. That is an attempt to give civil rights to the LGBTQ community. First, a definition. Homosexuality is a desire expressed in a sexual behavior or act. It's a basic, basic definition. Estimates are that less than 2% identify as homosexual, less than 2% identify as bisexual, and 0.3% identify as transgender. And this is, of course, you can see the reference there. So most will use this 2 to 4% argument when it comes to this topic, as you'll hear in the media sometimes. However, this small group with the media, again, Hollywood politicians on both sides, have a very powerful lobbying campaign around the world to get things changed. Which is one reason why it's no longer seen as a mental disorder. And this has or will impact every single one of us. And I know it's touched some of your lives too. And we also need to think of the next generations. Kids, grandkids, and what they're going to also be growing up with. And one area is civil rights. Now this again is currently taking place, but we have to ask, what does a civil right mean? This according to the Cambridge Dictionary says this. Civil rights are, quote, the rights of each person in society including equality under the law and employment and the right to vote, unquote. That's civil rights. Now, this was generally focused, primarily focused in the 1960s, where these rights were given to all Americans after the horrendous, horrible racial divide that occurred in this country. But in all honesty, civil rights have nothing to do with sexual orientation. which means that the definition of civil rights has been changed, and it has. The idea that homosexuals or bisexuals, uh, transgender individuals are, quote, born that way, which we'll deal with in a minute, and thus deserve special status like others who cannot change from their view, that's how it's been changed. That's how the definition of civil rights has been changed. And here, just to explain a little further, their view is that just because someone cannot change their skin color, a homosexual cannot change his or her sexual orientation. But the question is, is it true? Because when, and honestly, if and when, <clears throat> homosexuality, transgenderism, and more becomes or has an official legal status, this will affect ministries, churches, parachurch organizations, and missions organizations. Because sooner or later, there are groups that will purposely try to put people into these ministries. And if they are denied that job because of their sexual orientation, these ministries will get sued. You say, how do you know that? Well, let me give you one example that I know of somebody told me about that happened actually locally. There is a ministry that helps those with same-sex attraction. And... A new individual arrived at the meeting and started asking a lot of questions. And it turns out this person was a covert reporter for a gay magazine. And when he, he reported about these things, he reported lies about the organization, what they stood for, and what they were doing. Now again, I'm not saying every homosexual is going to do this, but the fact is there are some who will and there are groups that will purposely do these things. 
and various forms of legislation right now is being pushed through the government to try to get civil rights, and there will be more in the future, to grant these rights to these 2%, quote unquote, or 4%, however people want to say it. Think about this, and this is also happening, by the way. If and when homosexuality and transgenderism is given these new rights, others such as pedophiles and more will attempt to do the same thing and it is already occurring. Do a search online to find out that this is taking place too. In an attempt to say that these kind of relationships are healthy for kids. It's very sad. Civil rights is not a legitimate argument when it comes to this topic. Why? Well, homosexuals already have the same rights everyone has under civil law. They can get a job, they can vote, they can get an education and more. They've already got those civil rights. Which is why a redefinition of civil rights has been and will take place. Because by definition, a civil right is something inherent to someone's life that cannot change, like skin color. But again, they're using the argument that biologically they cannot change, which we'll get to here in just a minute. But scripture and life attests to the fact that homosexuals have been and can be changed by the power of the gospel, the person of Christ, and by faith in him. So that's the civil rights arguments. Now that brings us next to the biological arguments. And this is where we're going to spend quite a bit of time. This is where the gay gene comes in. Or I was born this way. How many of you have heard of that? The gay gene, I was born this way. Yeah, we think we saw part of that in the video there. Or something to this effect. And this is a major part of the argument used within this movement. But you need to know a few things. First of all, the Human Genome Project. Anybody ever heard of the Human Genome Project? Very, very fascinating and important. I love genetics. I wish I could study it more. I wish I was an expert in genetics. I looked at it, I study it some, but man, this is just astounding what, the, what you find when it comes to genetics itself. The Human Genome Project began in 1988, generally was completed in 2015. Now there's still some more studies going on, and what they did was mapping the human genome or the genetic structure of a human being. Not something that can be done in a few hours, <laughs> let me tell you. Again, there's still experiments today, but it gave a lot of insight to humans and even this topic of homosexuality. Now there is debate about the role of genetics, how much of a role it plays, if any, and this study did shed some light on it. And this is not something thrown together, by the way. These are groups of scientists who know their stuff, very serious about these things, <clears throat> and done a lot of experimentation when it comes to this topic. I'm going to quote an article from LifeSite News entitled, Homosexuality is Not Hardwired, concludes the head of the Human Genome Project. <coughs> so I've got it up here, I'm just going to read it to you. Quote, Francis S. Collins, one of the world's leading scientists who works at the cutting edge of DNA research, concluded, quote, that there is an inescapable component of heritability to many behavioral, human behavioral traits. However, he adds, for virtually none of them is heredity ever close to predictive. That is, just because you may be born with something doesn't mean it's going to happen. In reviewing the heritability of this influence of genetic factors on personality traits, Dr. Collins referenced the research of Bocard and McHugh for the estimated percentage of those traits that can be ascribed to heredity. Here's a few things. The heritability estimates for personality traits were varied. General cognitive ability, 50%. Extroversion, 54%. Agreeableness, 42%. Conscientiousness, 49%. Neuroticism, 48%. Openness, 57, aggression, 38, and transitionalism, 54%. Such estimates of heritability are based upon unbiased, careful analysis of studies conducted with identical twins. These studies lead the conclusion that hereditary is important in many of these personality traits. It is important, however, to note that even in such studies with identical twins, the heritability is not to be confused as inevitability. Just because somebody may have a genetic predisposition to something, doesn't mean it's going to happen. As Dr. Collins would agree, environment <coughs> can influence gene expression. And free will determines the response to whatever predispositions might be present. 
Dr. Collins succinctly reviewed the research on homosexuality and offers the following. He says this. <clears throat> An area of particularly strong public interest is the genetic basis of homosexuality. Evidence from twin studies, and this is important because they, they study the twins when it comes to the differences in between the male and the female, or the two boys and the two girls. Evidence from the twin studies does in fact support the conclusion that heritable factors play a role in male homosexuality. However, the likelihood that the identical twin of a homosexual male will also be gay is about 20%. So it's not a, not a major factor, compared with 2 to 4% of males in the general population. Indicating that sexual orientation is genetically influenced but not hardwired by DNA, and that whatever genes are involved present or represent predispositions, not predeterminations. Emphasis added. So it's not predetermined by genetics. The credibility estimates for homosexuality is substantially lower than general cognitive ability, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, openness, aggression, and traditionalism. <clears throat> Dr. Collins noted that environment, particularly childhood experiences, as well as the role of free will and choice, affect us all in profound ways. As researchers discover increasing levels of molecular detail about inherited factors that underlie our personalities, it is critical that such data be used to illuminate the issue not provide support for ideologies or to ideologies, unquote. And he continues with this. Unfortunately, <coughs> excuse me, much of the research in areas such as homosexuality has been misrepresented. And this actually happens a lot in the media, a lot. Not only in the media, but also by the scientists themselves through the tendency to overestimate through the quantitative contribution of their findings because there is an agenda. Regarding the contributions of genetics to areas such as homosexuality, Dr. Collins concluded, yes, we have, been all, we have all been dealt with a particular set of cards. The cards will eventually be revealed, but how we play the hand is up to us. Unquote. And again, that's the title, Homosexuality is Not Hardwired, concludes the head of the Human Genome Project. There have been other studies uh, since this one, <clears throat> and those who use these studies in support of homosexuality, again, will often point to this gay gene. It still has not been found yet, and it won't. It's just simply not true. I've got another article I'm going to quote from, uh, from stream.org. The title is, the, the entire LGBTQ narrative has just crumbled. And this is actually a little bit newer from this one. Sexuality and gender findings from the biological, psychological, and social sciences. Listen, I mean, this again, these are not little studies done in a corner somewhere. That was a human genome project. This one is another one. <clears throat> this study conducted by the world renowned Johns Hopkins University scientists. These are well known people in the scientific realm, in the medical realm. Dr. Lawrence S. Mayer and Dr. Paul R. McHugh is a meta analysis of data from over 200 peer-reviewed, and left-leaning studies regarding sexual orientation and gender identity. It was published in the fall of 2016 edition of the New Atlantis Journal and is far and away the most objective, exhaustive, and comprehensive study on the topic to date. And there's a lot more to this article. I just chose a few things, and some of the other ones we'll go back to on other, other topics. The research established, among other things, that this sexual orientation in adolescence is fluid over the life course of some people, with one study estimating that as many as 80% of male adolescents who report same-sex attractions no longer do so as adults. In other words, they grow out of it. Some other ones. <clears throat> the hypothesis that gender identity is an innate, fixed property of human beings that are independent of biological sex, that a person might be a man trapped in a woman's body, or a woman trapped in a man's body is not supported by scientific evidence. Studies comparing the brain structures of transgender and non-transgender individuals do not provide any evidence for a neurological basis for cross-gender identification. Only a minority of children who experience cross-gender identification will continue to do so into adolescence or adulthood. Continuing. 
lest you buy the left-wing talking point that so-called homophobia leads to high rates of suicide and other devastating consequences of the LGBTQ or T lifestyle, a recent study from Gay Affirming Sweden dispels this myth. The research, published in the May issue of the European Journal on Epidemiology, found that people entering into gay marriage were nearly three times as likely to commit suicide than their heterosexual counterparts, unquote. So when it comes to <clears throat> the biological arguments, again, this does not work realistically. You say, well, why do so many want to find this gay gene? Well, let me explain why. Again, going back to this biological argument here. One reason is that they can say, well, because it's genetic, I cannot change. That's one reason. But first, this actually contradicts their own statements and their standards when they say a man can become or identify as a woman or vice versa. Why? Because he or she feels like they're that gender. We are not even including genetic arguments in that case. If this was genetic, then they would stay the way they were born and not try hormone replacement therapy, which is absolutely devastating, particularly to kids. We don't know how devastating it is just yet. Second, there's another reason. Many want to find this genetically so they can claim, well, I was born this way or God made me that way. That's another argument. Third, this is the ultimate reason. It is an attempt to justify sin and a sinful lifestyle by saying choice is not involved at all, but that it's only genetically based. If they can find this genetic conne connection, the claims to those who try to help homosexuals or lesbians or etc. through counseling or therapy or biblical counseling and more can and will be accused and found guilty of causing these individuals to commit suicide turn to drugs, turn to alcohol, and more. And that is actually an argument, if you have not heard, by the way, that the reason that so many within this lifestyle are committing suicide is because of those who are trying to help them. When that's not the case. That's not true. In other words, those who have a biblical worldview of marriage and sexuality know that God can change someone, but we are the guilty ones for trying to tell them that they can change. Let me explain a little bit more. How many of you have ever heard of conversion or reparative therapy? Conversion therapy or reparative therapy? Just a few of you, okay? In the media, <clears throat> this phrase and ideology is called hate speech. It's hate speech. So let us <coughs> tell people, you know, write your senators, you know, tell them to make conversion therapy illegal. And by the way, it is illegal in 19 states in America. It's also illegal in Washington, D.C., and just recently re illegal in Puerto Rico. And even some counties within states, conversion therapy is outlawed. But you need to know that most of this is focused on minors. Because if you can get the kids, you've got them as adults. This Basically what this is, is therapy or counseling for people who do not want homosexuality in their life. That's actually what it is. As simple as that. <clears throat> but those within the gay lifestyle, within this gay agenda, equate this to something like shock treatment. Now for those who don't know what shock treatment is, they used to use electricity to shock people as therapy. And they're equating counseling, biblical counseling even, with shock treatment. Not all, but some. There are actually movies about this, documentaries, making it sound like something that it is not. So when you read news articles, when you hear interviews, when you read a blog or something, I see something online, uh, or have a conversation with someone who calls it, oh, how could you believe us, something like that. Remember that uh, they're looking at it from a very different way than you are if they're you know, demeaning it or distorting it and recognize the philosophy behind their arguments. If you do talk to somebody who jumps on this statement, accuses you of being cruel and evil, you know, for supporting this, say, well, so that we're talking about the same thing, can you please define what you mean by conversion or reparative therapy? 
and then well, let them give you their definition and say, well, this is actually just counseling, biblical counseling for those who are struggling with this and don't want it in their life. So we're, again, make sure you're talking about the same thing when uh, you're discussing this with someone. Also, too, when you are discussing this with another individual, when it comes to biological issues or uh, genetic issues or something like that, we do recognize that hormones and genetics and biological factors affect us. If you've ever been really tired, <laughs> it affects your thinking. You know, women who are pregnant, it affects their bodies because of their hormones. But to say that it is all genetics erases human responsibility and denies what the Bible teaches. I like what Alan Atsby said of the ministry called Living Waters. Um, and here's, here's another one too, by the way. I'll get to that in just a second. But here's another thing to ask them. Ask them about anger. Um, say, okay, well, for the sake of argument, let's say you do find a gay gene that makes someone gay that cannot change. Well, what about somebody who's angry? And they find a gene for that too. Does that justify them murdering someone? Does that justify them abusing children or women or the elderly? You ask about sexual abuse. Well, what if there's a, <clears throat> a, a sexual abuse gene? Does that excuse someone of rape or molesting children? What about if someone's an alcoholic and they have an alcoholic gene? I think there can be some factors in there. It runs in my family, which is one reason why I don't touch it. But does that justify alcoholism? Or what if they kill somebody while they're under the influence? Does that justify that? Ask them that. What about an adultery gene? What about a pornography gene or a drug addiction gene? <coughs> you ask them questions like these. And they may say, well, that's a category mistake. Here's a response to that. Is they say, well, you're being selective about homosexuality or transgenderism. So was, you can't argue the other ones the same way. Well, no, let's back up for just a moment. If you're saying there is a gay gene, why can't there be a genetic connection to other things too? Particularly when it comes to sexuality. Why can't there be a, uh, a sexual abuse gene? Again, using their argument. Not saying that you're agreeing with them or anything like that. Just saying, well, how's that going to fit? How's that going to work? Would you justify someone who murders someone because there's a anger gene within their body? Hopefully they would say no, but that's one way to respond to that. Now, we all have sin in our life. Even as Christians, we struggle. Everyone has a sin or sins they struggle with. We cannot blame our genetics on our actions. Again, hormones, yes, biological factors are involved. <coughs> But again, we cannot deny what Scripture says. We are responsible for our life, responsible for our actions, responsible for our choices. Again, this is what brings me to Alan Ansby's quote. He said this, quote, Just because a guy struggles with same-gender desire doesn't mean God made him a homosexual. Any more than a guy struggling with anger means that God made him a murderer. You have a choice about what you do with every temptation. It's because you may be tempted to do something, tempted to say something, tempted to go somewhere. You have a choice whether or not to say that, to do that, or to go there. Now, another question is asked. If it's not genetic, why do people get involved in this lifestyle? Now, there are theories about why this occurs, why people struggle with this. I've just mentioned a few. I'm not going to go into detail all about all these are, but I just want to mention a few of them and some potential contributing factors to those who struggle with this. Uh, the first one actually is a quote from one of the previous articles. Quote, compared to heterosexuals, non-heterosexuals are about two to three times as likely to have experienced childhood sexual abuse. This is one of the major factors. Another one is that I don't have up here is that they're actually introduced to the lifestyle by another homosexual or lesbian. That's another one too. Another one is the guy grew up with a domineering mother and a passive father. That's another possibility. Or the girl grew up with a bad relationship with her father. And one connection that we do see in 
most situations when it comes to individuals who are involved in this lifestyle is a bad relationship with their dad. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that before, but this is a factor. And one of the reasons I think that Satan has targeted families so much is because he knows the importance of the father in the home. And how important it is for a man to be there as a father. And But if the dad is absent, if he's abusive, if he's an addict, it does affect those kids. Some of you may know individuals or, or work with individuals who have been sexually abused as a child. And it affects them sometimes their entire life. And it is heartbreaking. And this is some of the potential reasons why some do get involved in this lifestyle. So these are some contributing factors possibly to this lifestyle. Though it doesn't fully explain why some struggle with it, some don't. There's Again, the aspect of our own choice and our own personality, too. And then what often occurs during puberty, these hurts, these abuses, these longings, this lack of relationship, this lack of closeness, become sexualized and then acted out in those relationships. But genetically, you're either XY or XX. You're either male or female. You cannot escape that. So if they do want to use the genetic argument, you've got to start with these two genetic genders which most people don't think about. So if somebody does want to argue genetics with you, say, well, wait a second. <clears throat> Let's argue uh, XY and XX first. The two genders. We say, well, what about those who have both sexual organs? Very, very small percentage. And you cannot use the exception to overrule the rule in this case. So be careful with that. And as you're discussing this with the individual, ask those who do embrace the gay gene or born this way arguments for evidence for their belief too. Just as they're asking you for evidence, ask them, okay, well, why do you believe that? What specific objective study was done that says there was a specific gay gene? What specific study was done objectively without influence from outside philosophies that substantiates the idea that you were born this way and that you cannot change. Ask them. Feel free to ask them. They're asking you. And then, of course, whatever evidence they give you, test that. So there's the biological arguments. And last for today, the pragmatic arguments. Pragmatic arguments. Here's a few of them. And again, you may have heard of these. Well, we should be able to love who we want. You saw that in the video. Well, we do have a choice to love who we want. But that doesn't mean it's a healthy relationship. And as I have up here, anyone who's been in a relationship with someone they love and had their heart or body broken, you know that we made the wrong choice. Been there, done that. You know, I, I, I should have chosen a different relationship instead of this. But just because someone can choose a relationship doesn't mean it's God's best for them. As, as a Bible teacher, as, you know, as a pastor, and even as a Christian, you know, we need to be aware of these topics in our world today. And some of you may have spoken to individuals and warned some people, don't go out with that guy, don't go out with that girl. And they do, and their life ends up a wreck. On more than one occasion, I've warned some girls that I know, don't marry that guy. And they do. And within a couple of years, they're divorced because of abuse or something like that. Well, he said he was a Christian. Where's the evidence for it? Well, he, he went to church with me once. Doesn't mean a thing. Well, she's so cute. Doesn't matter. What's on the inside? You know, so any of us who have been through difficult relationships or seen people go through difficult relationships despite warnings, you know that we can make the wrong choices. And it doesn't mean it's God's best. And those who live the homosexual lifestyle are choosing what is not God's best for them. Then there's the other argument. 
you know, we or they are not hurting anyone. That's a false argument. They hurt themselves and others emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Again, this is from a stream article. I'm going to quote from this. <clears throat> Listen to this. Gay identified people are at an elevated risk for, for a variety of adverse health and mental, out, mental health outcomes. Gay identified people experience nearly 2.5 times the risk of suicide. Not because of people trying to help them, but because this is a result of what they're choosing. Sex reassigned individuals are about five times more likely to attempt suicide and about 19 times more likely to die by suicide. And I don't have in, in, in this research, but if you do some research online, you will see that those who have had sex reassignment surgery and hormone replacement and all this stuff, a lot of them regret it and want to go back. Because they realize it's not going to fulfill the need they have in their heart. It doesn't change the fact of who they are, and they know it. Last one, it comes to this one, I quote. The rate of lifetime suicide attempts across all ages of transgender individuals is estimated, listen to this, 41% compared to under 5% of the overall U.S. population. Now these are very sad statistics. And, and we need to understand this because love demands that we tell them the consequences of their actions and their lifestyle. And I haven't even mentioned sexually transmitted diseases. AIDS and other things too. So these pragmatic arguments do not work. They cannot work. Now as we start to finish up this section, and like I said, there was so much that uh, I had to break it up into two parts. And we'll get to 1 Corinthians 6 here in just a few minutes. So if you have, by the way, if you have your Bibles or uh, your phones, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 6. And, uh, we'll look at that here in just a few moments. And we briefly just covered three arguments. Three arguments. <coughs> made for justifying the LGBTQ plus lifestyle. Give us some answers for each. Now I would encourage you to continue studying these on your own time. Um, because each one can go a lot more in depth. And you can be prepared to defend the biblical accounts of male and female. In the beginning, God made that. And discuss these things with those who would hate you for calling homosexuality sin. Now, Lord willing, next week we'll look more at the biblical arguments. You know, the scriptures that are taken, Leviticus and Romans and 1 Corinthians and others where they are unfortunately twisted and taken out of context and misunderstood. But also what the church has done and is doing in response to the homosexual push worldwide. You know, some have done some very good things and some have done some horrible things. But I do want to leave us with something today. There is hope. There is always hope. Whatever sin you struggle with, whether it is homosexuality or whether it's alcoholism or lying or stealing, whatever the case is, there is hope. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ. Only in Him. You can be changed and forgiven by God in Him. Because He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. Admit that you are a sinner. Believe in Jesus for salvation and his grace by faith alone. Confess him as Lord and Savior of your life and trust in his sacrificial atoning death on your behalf on the cross and his physical resurrection from the grave. And he will change you. Doesn't mean you won't struggle. Any Christian will tell you, I've still got struggle. <laughs> But it does mean he makes that change from the inside out, not from the outside in, which never works. Have you done this? And again, even if you have, you may struggle with some things. And if you are struggling with this or with other things, Grace Life is a community that will help you as best as we can.
to grow, to mature, and to be accountable to. And Christian, are you prepared to discuss these matters with other people? Rationally, biblically, lovingly, but uncompromisingly with those who may think very, very differently than you. I've given a few things that you can say, and Lord willing, next time we'll go into some more details, but I want to finish up with 1 Corinthians 6. Now, this is, we just read part of this uh, a few minutes ago. But I want to come back to it. And this is a text that we'll actually cover more next time. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9, 10, and 11. Or do you not know that unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's bad news. That's what God says. But there's hope. Verse 11. And such, notice the tense of the verb, were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And by the way, there's a, there's a trinity right here. This book that we talked about a few weeks ago. So these individuals here were practicing a lot of ungodly things in their life. But Paul says, God saved you out of those things. That's not who you are anymore. And a big part of the struggle with individuals is identity. You don't find your identity in anything other than Christ. You will not find out who you are unless you're in Christ. Such were some of you, but you were washed. That's a picture of the Old Testament washing, cleansing. You were sanctified, that is, Positionally, you are set apart by God. Progressively, you're being sanctified, being made more and more like Christ every day to help you overcome whatever those things that you struggled with. Next one, next verb. You are justified, declared righteous by God as an act of judicial action, not guilty. But I did not guilty. But I've done not guilty. And Christian, if you put your faith in Christ, God has declared you not guilty also. That is grace. Justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It's all by His grace, all by His power, all by His work. Why? Because of what Jesus did on the cross. In his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, there, were, there are those who would disagree with what I just said when it comes to this text. We'll cover that more willing next week. But I wanted to leave us with hope today. Because there is always hope with God. There is always hope in Christ. There is always hope in the gospel. So whatever issue you have, whatever struggle you have, bring it to Jesus. Give it to him. Ask him to forgive you and to give you the strength to overcome, and he will. He will. And I know individuals who have been saved from this. Maybe some of you do too. Again, further evidence that God can change. And if you are a Christian, guess what? He's changed you. He's adopted you into his family. He's made you a new creation in Christ. And that cannot change. You cannot lose that adoption. You are forever his child. What a wonderful, wonderful truth as we finish this up today. Let's bow for prayer, please. Before I pray, for those who are here, for those who are watching, those who are listening later. There is hope. There is help. There is a Savior. 
And there is freedom in Christ. Maybe you don't struggle with homosexuality. Maybe you struggle with something else. We all have <coughs> The same truth goes for you too. Maybe you're looking for a church home. Consider Grace Life. We preach Christ. We preach His Word. We preach the change that is in Him and Him alone. But we also deal with some very difficult topics. Which we must do today in our world. Because we love people. Because we love God. And now our fathers, we come to you in prayer. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you can and have and will change people who come to you in faith through Christ. And Lord, it doesn't matter the sin. What matters is we have a great Savior who has overcome the world, overcome the devil, and overcome the flesh. And I pray, Father, for anyone who's struggling for any with any sin, whatever the case is, that if they have not trusted in Christ alone for salvation, that he or she or they will do that right now. Saying, Lord, save me, a sinner. I trust in Jesus alone for salvation. Forgive me, come into my life. So, Father, I pray that for many today. And Lord, for those of us who are Christians, I pray, Lord, that you will help us with the struggles we still have. We don't have it all together. We admit that, we confess that. But we live in the light of the sufficiency of Christ and the sufficiency of your word and the promises of your word. So, Father, help us. And help us, Lord, to be truly loving, compassionate, but truthful in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way when it comes to discussing these issues with people who have a different view. So, Father, I pray that you will give us wisdom, give us discernment, and give us your love for everyone, no matter who they are or what they struggle with. <coughs> so, Lord, here we are, work in our hearts. Change us, mold us, make us into the image of Christ. Because just like these Corinthians, <coughs> if we are in Christ, we too have been washed, sanctified, and justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by your Spirit, O oh God. So we thank you, we love you, we praise you, and we sing, I am redeemed. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb because of your grace. And we praise you, and we commit all this to you in the wonderful, mighty, matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Once again, we have the uh, connection cards on the table. <coughs> and, um, again, if you have questions, ideas, thoughts, requests, prayer requests, praises, song requests, whatever the case is, please write that down. Please fill those out. And uh, we'll put it in the offering that's coming out in just a few moments. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and pray for uh, the offering. And uh, we'll take up uh, the gifts that we're going to Gracious God, our Father, we again thank you for your word, thank you for your grace, and thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to give. Lord, you gave so much to us, and we thank you that we can give back to you. It already belongs to you, it's not, not, it doesn't belong to us, but Lord, I do pray you give us wisdom on how to spend your money to further the gospel, to take care of the facility here, to help other people, and to be the men and women in the body of Christ that you call us to. Thank you. We put it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.